Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, constitution and economy. Question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has introduced to boost the economy in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. Presiding Officer, Scotland's economic strategy reaffirms our commitment to increasing sustainable economic growth for all of Scotland, which is essential to achieving a more productive, cohesive and fairer country. Our continued investment in infrastructure, regeneration and business support helps to boost the economy in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, as he will be aware, the dairy industry is an important part of the local economy. How does the Cabinet Secretary see the recently launched Dairy Action Plan assisting local milk producers and how might that benefit the local economy in general? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senior Officer, uh, Mr Coffey is absolutely correct that the dairy sector uh, plays an important and economic role in many rural parts of Scotland, including in the Kilmarnock and Irvine Irv Irv Valley constituency. The dairy plan that was uh, launched by the, the Rural Affairs Secretary Richard Lockhead on the 24th of March aims to improve the resilience of the Scottish dairy sector and provide the, rap, the right platform to ensure the entire industry can thrive against the backdrop of a very volatile world market. And some of the contents of the government's economic strategy about encouraging innovation, about improving productivity and focusing and encouraging companies to look at international business opportunities all will be relevant to the activities of the dairy industry within the Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley area. And I would encourage uh, Mr Coffey uh, to, uh, to point his constituents in the direction of finding active ways in which they can participate in developing that strategy in the local area. Thank you. Supplementary from John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware how important Kilmarnock College as part of the Ayrshire Colleges is to the economy in Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. The Cabinet Secretary will also be aware of the funding shortfall in the Ayrshire College budget for 2015-16, a shortfall which is being met in this financial year by turning de depreciation into hard cash. Will the shortfall in the 2015-16 budget for the Ayrshire College and others be again met by using cash allocated in budget terms for depreciation to meet the cash requirements of student funding at that time, or will other sources of funding be provided? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Scott will be familiar with the allocations of resources that have been made as part of the annual budget round, which concluded in early February which gave allocations to the Scottish Funding Council, who of course then in turn distribute the resources to the Ayrshire College. And the dialogue about the appropriateness and the utilisation of the resources available to the Funding Council and then by onward transit onto Ayrshire College is a matter for the Funding Council to determine in dialogue and discussion with the Ayrshire College and the Government would expect that dialogue to focus on supporting the achievement of the outcomes that the government seeks from its investment in the further education sector. Thank you. Question number two, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the economy and public services. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. Scotland's economic strategy set out an overarching framework and actions for increasing competitiveness and tackling inequality in Scotland. We also remain focused on delivering a cross-sector programme of public sector reform and a clear strategic direction for protecting and improving Scotland's public services is now well established. Thank you, Neil Bibby. The main fiscal policy of the SNP government is, of course, full fiscal autonomy, which would lead to £7.6 billion of cuts, according to the IFS. Can I, the Finance Secretary tell us when he wants to see full fiscal autonomy come into force? And why does he think a policy that would lead to £7.6 billion of cuts is a good idea? Cabinet Secretary. The first thing I'd say to Mr Bibby is that I believe that full fiscal autonomy would give Scotland the economic levers to strengthen our economic performance and as a consequence to improve the productivity and, in, and, and as a further consequence the finances of the public finances of the country. Uh, I don't really think that's a particularly surprising ambition given the fact that uh, I thought we were all here to try to improve economic performance and to deliver stronger public finances as a consequence. And if Mr Bibby is the slightest bit concerned about cuts, mm. then he should look at his Labour Party proposition for the forthcoming election, right. which has signed up to the Charter That's for right. Budget Responsibility, which yeah. involves £30 billion pounds worth of cuts, before Mr Bibby oh, comes anywhere near me 
he should reconcile the issues in his own Order. party and the slash and burn cuts that the Labour Party will impose on public services in Scotland. Question number three, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Revenue Scotland IT system. Cabinet Secretary. The implementation of the Scottish Electronic Tax System is an operational matter for Revenue Scotland. I discussed this issue with the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland this morning. The system opened for sign-up for both the devolved taxes on the 16th of February and registration opened for the Scottish <laughs> landfill tax on the same day. The online return for land and buildings transaction tax has been available to users since the 24th of March. I am pleased to inform Parliament the Chief Executive confirmed to me that, as planned, the system has today started to collect the first national tax introduced by the Scottish Parliament in over 300 years, and it undertook that online. Gavin Brown. I am grateful for that answer, and I am glad that the uh, first one went through fine online. Um, what percentage of transactions today, approximately, does the uh, Deputy First Minister think will be done through the online portal? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I do not know what that proportion will be. It will be for the market to determine. But I can say to Mr Brown that as of about 1.45 this afternoon, 83 transactions had been undertaken on the online system. Um, I told Parliament that the online system would be available for operation on the 1st of April. There were some doubters in Parliament. I would have thought some of them could have come to Parliament and congratulated Revenue Scotland on the achievement of having an online system available, but perhaps that's too much to ask on a Wednesday afternoon. Jackie Bailey. Um, can I congratulate Revenue Scotland for um, operating online? But, but before we congratulate ourselves, um, yesterday a firm of solicitors contacted an MSP to complain that the new land and building transaction tax forms were not yet available. I am assuming that's because he was a day early. However, the Cabinet Secretary will of course be aware that conveyancing tra transactions can't be registered at Register House without a tax paid certificate. So can he confirm that there are no problems at all with the implementation implementation of Scotland's new landfill tax and also the land and buildings transaction tax. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I, I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for her warm words towards Revenue Scotland. It's in stark contrast to what she was drivelling on about in the Times on Monday um, on the issues uh, in the Times newspaper. But uh, in relation to the... In relation to the... Uh, in relation to the implementation of land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax, the Government has taken forward the arrangements to put these in place. There has been good cooperation between the uh, Registers of Scotland and SEPA, who will be involved in the administration of both taxes, uh, and to put them in place in cooperation with Revenue Scotland. And I am satisfied with the arrangements that have been put in place. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I will use this opportunity to remind all members that they should use parliamentary language and be respectful to each other. Question number four, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government on the implementation of the Smith Agreement. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, since the United Kingdom Government published its draft clauses on the 22nd of January, the Scottish Government has provided a range of detailed comments on the drafting and the scope of the clauses, with the aim of ensuring they implement the Smith Commission recommendations in full. This has been accompanied by discussions at ministerial and official level, including two meetings of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare. The Scottish Government has also started work on development of the fiscal framework, which will be a critical element in implementing the Smith Commission proposals. I met the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 2nd of March to discuss the progress on this work. Tim Eady. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. He will be aware that academic analysis by Robert Gordon University shows that the draft new clauses watered down the already minimalist provisions of the Smith Agreement. Does he agree that the absence of the power to create new benefits and the restrictions placed on the categories of people to whom benefits can be paid clearly shows that the UK Government is already reneging on the implementation of the Smith Agreement and that therefore the only way to deliver significant additional powers to this Parliament is to send a strong team of SNP MPs to Westminster to speak up and stand up for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah. Presiding, Presiding Officer, the, there are a number of, um, there are a number of issues that the Government has raised with the United Kingdom Government in relation to the detailed um, definition of the clauses that were published on the 22nd of January. And we have shared with the Devolution Further Powers Committee the detail of that information uh, that we believe has to be addressed. So the, 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 the Scottish Government has engaged constructively with the UK Government on the specifics 
of what we believe is deficient about the draft clauses put in place by the UK Government and which are now um, subject to consultation. I should point out to Mr Reedy that, of course, a number of these observations have also been um, reinforced by the observations of a number of the stakeholders who have been involved in the dialogue around the implementation of these clauses. And I hope um, that these issues are properly uh, addressed by the incoming United Kingdom Government. And we, we made that point uh, in our discussions. Uh, finally, um, Mr Eady is absolutely correct that the, uh, the, approach, the best approach to safeguard Scotland's interests will be to secure the election of a strong team of SNP MPs at Westminster who will be able to protect and promote the Scottish interest on all occasions and without reservation. Annabel Goldie. Uh, Deputy President, Officer, I note the Scottish Government has stopped referring to vetoes being contained in the new powers. Can I welcome this development? And will this Cabinet Secretary confirm that the two governments working together constructively to deliver the new powers will do much more to secure Scotland's interests than trying to undermine the process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I'll, 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 happily use, I'll happily restore the veto word to my answer if it would suit Ms Goldie better. But there is a, a very serious point at the heart of what Ms Goldie raises. Because Ms Goldie says there is no veto in all of this. In the Smith Commission proposals, one of the co commitments that Ms Goldie and I made was to secure the earliest possible devolution of the work programme. Well, essentially, last week, the United Kingdom government vetoed the early devolution of the work programme. During the course of the Smith process, Ms Goldie and I were arguing for the, the work programme to be devolved early. We're echoed in that position by the Labour Party. Indeed, a Labour member of Parliament in the Westminster Parliament, Ian Murray, has put forward a private member's bill to seek the earliest possible devolution, I think this summer, if my memory serves me right, of the work programme. That has been vetoed by the United Kingdom government. And the contracts, have, it's not just that it's been vetoed, the contracts <coughs> have been extended against the express will of the Scottish government. Now, if we, so I, I'm all for cooperation on the substance of these issues. And I've marshaled to the United Kingdom government a detailed list of areas where we think the draft clauses are deficient in terms of the objectives of the Smith process. And we've shared that with the Devolution for the Powers Committee. I do hope that we have a willingness to engage constructively and solidly in implementing not just the letter of the Smith Commission report, but the spirit of the Smith Commission report into the bargain, which on the example I've cited to Ms Goldie was about early action to ensure that the earliest possible devolution was delivered of the work programme. Thank you. Question number five, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has filled all the vacancies at Revenue Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the staffing of Revenue Scotland is an operational matter for Revenue Scotland. I spoke to the Chief Executive this morning. She confirmed that 38 of 40 operational posts have now been filled, providing Revenue Scotland with the breadth and depth of experience it requires to collect and manage the devolved taxes. Recruitment processes are underway for the two remaining posts, neither of which was identified as critical for the 1st of April launch. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for your reply. Have the salaries offered been increased? And if so, what impact will this have on the organisation's cost? Cabinet Secretary. Th there have been uh, no increases to salaries beyond what we have set out to the Finance Committee as part of the, and the Public Audit Committee as part of this process. So there are no changes to the financial arrangements that have been shared openly uh, by the government. Um, we, we've done that on a number of occasions. Uh, we set it out at the stage of the financial memorandum. Uh, the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland was in front of the Audit Committee and the Finance Committee in December, if my memory serves me right, and uh, further information on financial provisions have been made at those stages, and there are uh, no changes since, uh, since those updates were given to the, the relevant committees. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Question number six has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. I therefore call question number seven, Graeme Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the House of Lords Constitution Committee report proposals for the devolution of further powers to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government agrees with the Committee that the proposed Scotland Bill should receive detailed scrutiny when it is introduced after the UK election. The Bill and the accompanying fiscal framework will need to be scrutinised carefully in this Parliament to ensure that it reflects the substance and the spirit of the Smith Commission proposals. The Scottish Government has suggested changes to the draft clauses across a range of areas to bring them closer to the intentions of the Smith report. 
I hope that the new UK Government will work with us to make these improvements and to ensure that the additional powers are transferred to the Scottish Parliament as soon as possible. I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer, but I wonder whether he would agree with me that it's an outrage for a group of unelected peers to respond as they have to the prospect of this Parliament obtaining increased powers. And does he also agree with me that it's high time the democratic anomaly that is the House of Lords was addressed by abolition? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, Mr Day in relation to the, the abolition of the House of Lords. In relation to the report of the Select Committee which has come forward. Um, the report um, expresses a number of, of different issues, um, some of which I, I think are worthy of being uh, taken uh, further forward and, to, and considered. Uh, some of them uh, I don't really think require much attention, but in the course of the parliamentary scrutiny, Parliament will have the opportunity to consider any relevant remarks that come from this committee and how they may have an effect on the formulation of the legislation involved. A brief supplementary from Annabel Goldie. Well, to the great disappointment of Mr Day, I'm still around, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, and occupying a place in another, another House. The Lords Committee noted that Scotland and the UK have been in a period of constitutional upheaval for 15 years, and that's unprecedented in mature Western democracies. Can the Cabinet Secretary commit that once the new powers are in effect, the Scottish Government will end constitutional wrangling and give the new powers a chance to work effectively for the people of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think there's a, the, the, there's a pretty fundamental point in amongst all of this that we've gone through in the aftermath of the referendum since September. The first is that where there is a need uh, and an, an obligation in terms of the political process for this government to cooperate to implement particular changes that arise, the government cooperates to the full. So, for example, in relation to the, um, the formulation of the approach on land and buildings transaction tax and on the landfill tax and on various other provisions that arose out of the Kalman Commission, uh, which, if my uh, memory serves me right, was Goldie founded but didn't serve on, um, the the, the government has taken forward uh, all of those uh, provisions in a spirit of effective cooperation. And, and in fact, we've got to that point in relation to land and buildings transaction tasks because the Exchequer Secretary and I were able to exchange correspondence just the other day there, which enabled the UK government to switch off stamp duty land tax in Scotland and for me to switch on land and buildings transaction tax. Perfectly orderly arrangements to make that happen. And wherever that is required, this government will undertake that activity. However, Ms Goldie must appreciate, and, and I would have thought this is something that she does, uh, that, that those of us on these benches have a different view of the constitutional arrangements that should be appropriate for Scotland. These are appropriately held, deeply held, sincerely held views about the arrangements of our country, just as deeply and sincerely held as I know Ms Goldie's are about her position. And we simply have to leave it to the people of our country to decide what should be our future, and we're happy to enable them to do exactly that. Thank you. Question number eight, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Committee on Climate Change's expert statement that further actions are required if the 2020 renewable heat target is to be met. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. We welcome the Committee on Climate Change's consideration of progress and action in regard to the emissions reductions in Scotland. We are making progress on the target for 11 per cent on non-electrical heat demand from renewables by 2020, but there is no doubt that it will be a challenging to meet, particularly in the context where we do not have the full range of drivers within our competence. For example, the renewable heat incentive is a UK government scheme. In order to focus and drive pace of change, we published in 2014 our draft heat generation policy statement. It has a particular focus on encouraging uptake of renewable heat technology and maximising potential for existing and renewable heat sources, and we expect the final statement to be published soon. Sarah Boyack. I, I'd like to thank the Minister for that response. Um, will the Scottish Government publish an update on progress towards the Expert Commission's 18 recommendations, and will the specific points raised by the uh, Climate Change Committee's uh, report be actioned urgently. Um, for example, there are many things that can be done in the Scottish Government's competence, such as the delivery of a heat network's delivery unit and requiring consideration of district heating and all new developments. And if the Minister doesn't feel able to confirm those issues today, would he ask the Energy Minister if he'd be prepared to meet with me to discuss taking these issues forward? Minister. 
I thank, thank the member for the, the way she's put the question. Um, I could go through some of, some of the issues that she has raised, but I, I do recognise the member's long-standing and, and in-depth um, commitment to this area, so I think it is probably best if we um, arrange for a meeting with the Minister and, and the member. Thank you. Question number nine, uh, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to grow the economy in Mid-Scotland and Fife. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to boosting economic growth and tackling inequality across Scotland. In Mid-Scotland and Fife, we continue to support economic growth with substantial investment in infrastructure and business support. For example, 113 businesses across Mid-Scotland and Fife have benefited from over £55 million of regional selective assistance awards since 2007, creating or safeguarding 5,603 jobs. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree that for the long-term sustainable growth of the Scottish economy, we must shift the balance of investment towards manufacturing? And can he provide me with more detail of the progress being made to bring such investment for strategic employment sites in Fife, including the Rosyth waterfront area, the Motorola site in Dunfermline and the Energy Park in Methil? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the fundamental point that Jane Baxter raises, I uh, agree entirely that uh, the government's economic strategy is focused on strengthening innovation on encouraging inclusive growth of uh, supporting investment in uh, particular companies and the wider infrastructure of the country and also to encouraging companies to be uh, more actively involved in the uh, in the wider uh, international business activity in relation to the particular sites that um, Jane Baxter referred to um, additional freight capacity on the 4th was identified as a national development um, to uh, assist in ensuring that pr uh, proposals for the development of the Rosyth facility um, are delivered and that remains a central part of the national planning framework. Three, um, the Scottish Enterprise of course have been heavily involved in investment in the uh, methyl site and uh, we will continue to encourage and to support economic development in that site. And the, there are a number of very focused initiatives the government takes to ensure that we have sites available for particular development and to encourage uh, manufacturing companies to, um, to either locate or to expand and to grow in these areas. The final point I'd say is that obviously the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, which is available through the work of Scottish Enterprise, is available to companies in the um, uh, in the uh, in, in the locality and we would encourage companies in the Fife area to take up those opportunities. Thank you, Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what are the potential benefits to the mid-Scotland and Fife economy of the University of St Andrews Renewable Energy Project at Card Bridge? Cabinet Secretary. Um, th this is one of a number of, uh, of energy projects that are taken forward. Um, there are uh, a number, uh, Jane Baxter obviously referred to, to one in relation to the energy park at, uh, at Methyl. Um, we encourage and support the development of uh, renewable energy projects throughout the country and I'm sure that what, the work that is underway at St Andrews uh, will be of great benefit in expanding and developing uh, knowledge and the approach to project development within these areas. Thank you, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. One proposal from the Scottish Government that will have an impact on the Mid-Scotland and Fife economy is the plan to reintroduce business rates on sporting interests. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us if these rates will be charged on all agricultural land to which sporting rights are attached? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the Government is uh, still engaged in the detailed consultation around all of these questions. Um, we will, when we set out our further proposals on land reform, the uh, particular issue that Mr Fraser raises will be dealt with in that consultation um, and the, the, the government believes that uh, the anomaly that is created by the absence of business rates from sporting estates is something that should be closed as part of the land reform process uh, and we'll set out the detail in due course. Many thanks. Question number 10, Alex Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, uh, what steps it is taking to help regenerate the economy of Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting sustainable economic growth and regeneration in Dumfries and Galloway. We support the work of the South of Scotland Alliance, which is driving forward the South of Scotland Rural Regional Economic Development Programme. Projects in that programme will encourage economic activity, promote growth, increase inward investment and protect and create employment across Dumfries and Galloway. Alex Ferguson. 
great for that answer. And I can think of no greater stimulus to the economy of my constituency than the regeneration of Stranraer Harbour waterfront, uh, a large area of prominent land that has become increasingly derelict since Stenner, the ferry company, moved to its new port facility north of Ken Ryan. Uh, I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the South of Scotland Alliance. They came and gave us a briefing here just two weeks ago, and they highlighted the importance of this development as one of their top priorities. There are reportedly two bids being considered for the redevelopment of that site, but no outcome has been forthcoming, despite one being promised for some time. So may I ask what steps the Cabinet Secretary might be able to take to try to move this process forward? And would he consider the creation of a special enterprise zone around Stranra uh, if no bids actually materialise? Cabinet Secretary. I discussed this issue when I last met the South of Scotland Alliance in Dumfries, um, which was several weeks ago, and uh, the local authority, Dumfries and Galloway Council, they have the lead role in relation to the regeneration of the Stranraer waterfront, so the consideration of the bids to which Mr Ferguson refers is a matter entirely for the, uh, for the local authority, and I, I certainly am not cited on any of the detail about that bidding process, nor should I be. Um, for that matter. Uh, what I said to the South of Scotland Alliance is that I could see the strategic significance of the Stranraer waterfront and therefore the, um, once they were further through their process in relation to considering the bids, I'd be happy to discuss further with the, the, the local authority and the South of Scotland Alliance how we might bring together different interests and parties and players to try to uh, tackle what I recognise is a significant issue for the Stranra area in Mr Ferguson's constituency. So um, the, the, the ball at this stage is in the court of the local authority, but I don't say that to, uh, to say the government has nothing to do with it. The government will happily engage constructively with the, uh, the council on this point. The South of Scot I encourage the South of Scotland Alliance to formulate uh, essentially an economic agenda of how they wish to advance key projects across the whole of the area. They've responded to that very uh, constructively and I now have committed to meeting the South of Scotland Alliance twice a year to ensure that government agencies are actually engaging to my satisfaction with the agenda that the South of Scotland Alliance has created. Now, I welcome the leadership that's been put in place by both local authorities and I'm pledged to ensure that the government engages uh, constructively in any way we can to help deliver their agenda. Brief supplementary, Graham Pearson. Yeah. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I attended the meeting with the South of Scotland Alliance, and very specifically, they mentioned the absence of financial support from central government. Amongst the issues that the Cabinet Secretary will consider, will we also consider the very helpful use of Scottish Government finance to support the initiative? Cabinet Secretary. I think it, it really depends on, on, on what emerges as a project. There will be a multiplicity of different issues the government would have to consider, not least of which if, you know, for example, a private developer came forward to develop the Stranraer waterfront, there would undoubtedly be issues of state aid that the government would have to consider, which are not issues we can ignore. Um, so I, I, as I think I made clear in my answer to Mr Ferguson, the government is very willing to um, engage in substantive dialogue with the South of Scotland Alliance on these projects. I, I asked the, the Alliance to come up with a substantive agenda that would advance these questions. They have now done that, and we will uh, maintain that discussion with my uh, six monthly meetings with them to consider what are the most effective ways in which the government can assist in any way we can. Thank you. Question number 11, James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the post-budget briefing by the Institute for Fiscal Studies which finds that the poorest have seen the biggest proportionate losses as a result of the UK Government's tax and benefit changes. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, the Institute for Fiscal Studies has indicated that looking at the tax and benefit changes implemented by the current UK Government, the poorest have suffered the biggest proportionate losses. Uh, clearly, the United Kingdom Government's austerity agenda and welfare cuts have significantly reduced incomes for some of our poorest households and are undermining our efforts to tackle poverty. We are doing what we can to help those affected. We are investing around £296 million from 2013-14 to 2015-16 to limit the damage of the cuts and changes being introduced. We cannot fully mitigate all of the effects of welfare changes, but we will continue to make the argument for a fairer welfare system. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is clear from the IFS analysis that not only is austerity not working, but that our alternative of modest real-term spending increases in each year of the next Parliament instead of cuts would see the deficit and debt fall as a share of our national income. 
freeing up billions of pounds to reinvest in our infrastructure, skills, public services and protecting our people. Does the Minister agree with me that this just highlights the need for a vote for the SNP in a couple of weeks to offer the best opportunity to stand up for all the people of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think what, what's clear from the current debate is that there are alternative approaches that can be taken to austerity and the Scottish Government believes that's the case. We've uh, long argued for that position and uh, that issue is one on which people can use their votes effectively in the forthcoming general election. Very briefly, Jackie Bailey. Um, we discovered at the start of this week that the SNP had signed up to Tory austerity plans for 2015-16. Given what James Dornan has said, why have the SNP joined with the Tories in continuing austerity? And does he agree with the IFS analysis that there is a £7.6 billion black hole in the Scottish budget with full fiscal Cabinet autonomy? I, I, I really don't know what on earth Jackie Bailey is referring to about the start of the week. Um, the Scottish Government has been absolutely crystal clear that we oppose austerity and Jackie Bailey, Jackie Bailey would do us all a service if she and the Labour Party would take a different tack to the one that they have taken and would support an approach of investment in the economy to deliver the economic growth that I thought Jackie Bailey would be interested in delivering to create new hope and new opportunities for people in our country. But as usual, Jackie Bailey is continuing her partnership with the Conservatives, which saw her go through the last couple of years hand in hand, better together, and it's going through the election campaign into the bargain. Question number 12, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact on the Scottish economy would be of the UK leaving the EU. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government firmly believes that exiting the EU would have a deeply damaging impact on Scotland's economy. Uh, membership of the EU provides us to access with the largest single market in the world, over 500 million potential customers. In 2013, the EU was the destination for 46% of Scottish exports, worth almost 13 billion. On top of that, over 300,000 Scottish jobs depend on those EU exports. That's why the Scottish Government will continue to make the case for Scotland's membership of the EU going forward, uh, as set out in our action plan for EU engagement launched last Friday, along with our booklet on the benefits of EU membership. Colin Beatty. The Minister will be aware that there are many individuals from other parts of the EU who live and work in Scotland and whose status may be affected by a decision for the UK to withdraw from the EU. I'd be grateful if the Minister could outline what constitutional measures could be put in place to prevent Scotland being taken out of the EU against the wishes of our people. Minister. I think the member highlights a very important point, particularly in the run-up to the general election. We know that uh, anti-EU migration rhetoric has been hyped up and many parties have, have got behind that. But I think all of us would recognise that EU migrants in Scotland have played a, a very positive role. Uh, research from UCL has shown that between 2001 in 2011, they contributed £20 billion to the economy. And of course, Scots who are on the continent, as the member says, also making a, a very positive uh, contribution wherever they are. So it would have a drastic, uh, a UK exit from the EU would have a drastic uh, consequence and uh, a really catastrophic consequence on our economy. Uh, that's why the First Minister herself has made clear that we believe in a double lock on membership with an exit only possible if a majority of people in all four constituent parts of the UK vote to leave. Thank you. Question number 13, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government whether it supports more progressive taxation for those on the very highest incomes and those with the most expensive property. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government has set out its approach to taxation, which is based on the four principles set out by Adam Smith, certainty, convenience, efficiency of collection, and that taxes should be proportionate to the ability to pay. The Government placed fairness, equity and the ability to pay at the very heart of the first decisions we have taken on national tax rates. We have also set up the Commission on Local Tax Reform, whose remit will, will enable it to show how progressive the alternative tax systems it identifies can be and the significance of any changes to both taxpayers and the funding of public services. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has played uh, catch-up with Labour on the uh, 50p tax rate for those with the highest incomes, contradicting what uh, Alex Salmon said on the Andrew Marr show 10 days ago, but will he go further now and also support a mansion tax in order to provide extra money for the NHS, a banker's bonus tax in order to provide a job and training guarantee, and changes to the uh, pension tax relief for the richest pensioners in order to provide more opportunities for young people? Well, 
I think the, the, the point I'd, I'd say to uh, Mr Chisholm is that I think we should be judged on the actions that we take on these questions. And the actions that we've taken on these questions is that when we had the opportunity to set particular tax rates, the Scottish Government has used the first available opportunity on land and building That's transaction right. tax to essentially do exactly what Mr Chisholm is talking about in his, in his question of ensuring that on property transactions, those who are living on the highest value properties pay more. So under the system that I've put in place, which Mr Chisholm's party voted for, 90% um, of taxpayers are paying the same or less under the system and 10% are paying more. And these are the people who are living in the higher value property. So I would have thought that would have been a, a reasonable reassurance to Mr Chisholm about the direction of travel. But of course, when it came to deciding on the issue about the 50 pence tax rate in the House of Commons, my colleague Stuart Hosey, the Member, for Dund or the Member of Parliament in the last House of Commons for Dundee East, moved that the 50p tax uh, rate be restored. But Mr Chisholm's colleagues, for That's some right. unbelievable <laughs> reason, couldn't find it in themselves to vote in favour yeah. of such a proposition. Because now, we, I, we now, I, I, now I think the only... The I, I'm, told, I'm told that this is about the Bain principle, <laughs> that, this is, that no proposal that comes forward from the Scottish National Party should be supported. That's now, that shame. seems shame. to me to be um, a, a, a rather <laughs> short-sighted action by the Labour Party, but we look forward to utilising the influence we have in the House of Commons to deliver fairness yeah. and prosperity in the aftermath of the United Kingdom general election and we will bring those values to bear in any situation beyond the UK election. A brief supplementary and a brief answer please join Mason. Thank you. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary uh, agrees that uh, Westminster's 2% NIC rate for high earners is regressive rather than progressive. Cabinet Secretary. Um, the Scottish Government uh, believes that taxation should, in all circumstances, be related to the ability to pay. Um, and what I'd say to Mr Mason is that in, uh, you know, our, our belief is that uh, these decisions, important decisions about the management of the tax arrangements, um, can be best served and best undertaken by the decision making that we undertake in this Parliament and um, where we can take the opportunity, as we have done on land and buildings transaction tax, to deploy the values of fairness and equity which have been at the heart of our decision making. Thank you. Question number 14 has not been lodged for, and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question 15, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what is it doing to support the oil and gas industry? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is using all of the levers under, under our control to support the oil and gas industry. Um, at this time, the F Energy Minister, Fergus Ewing, is in the United States undertaking uh, meetings and discussions with various interested parties in the North Sea oil and gas sector. There is an extensive network of support for the oil and gas industry delivered through Scottish Enterprise, Highlands Lands Enterprise, Scottish Development International, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. We have established the Energy Jobs Task Force, which has now met three times and has recently published its action plan setting out some of the key measures that are, taking f that are being taken forward with the backing and support of key industry leaders. Christian Allard. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Uh, will you agree with me that the U-turn from the Chancellor George Osborne on taxation of the oil and gas industry was an admission that his policy for the North Sea has been wrong and the poor stewardship by the UK government has had a detrimental impact on our oil and gas sector. Would you agree that he has been another case of too little, too late, and that many job losses could have been avoided? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I certainly, I, well, I, I want to say first of all that, as the government has made clear, that we welcome the steps that were taken by the United Kingdom government in the budget statement on the 18th of March. The reduction of the supplementary charge, the introduction of the basin-wide investment allowance, the reduction of petroleum revenue tax and the modest investment in exploration um, were all welcome. But I think what they indicate is that the United Kingdom government has realised that its stewardship of the North Sea oil and gas regi regime on taxation purposes had to be dramatically revised as a consequence of the results that had been generated from the significant increase in particularly the supplementary charge that had taken place since the UK government came to office. Add to that the fact that a new oil and gas authority has been put in place, changing the regulatory regime. 
That demonstrates that in the course of the last um, 18 months, the UK has changed fundamentally both the fiscal regime and the regulatory regime, which demonstrates to me that there is acknowledgement that the UK has ill-served the North Sea oil and gas sector with the way in which it's taken forward its policy agenda. Now, the changes that have been made in the budget are welcome, and I do hope that they are taken as a signal by the oil and gas industry that there is an, an opportunity to invest in the North Sea sector, and that is taken up by um, interested parties. I'm afraid that concludes uh, questions, and I apologise to the members we have not reached. We turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12857 in the name of.